Good morning. Morning to those online as well. It's good to be together, uh, however and whenever we can. And today we're finishing up our series on living hope-filled and hopeful lives. The idea of hope is impactful. It's a major thought in Scripture in that our hope is based on who Jesus is. And we've looked at different traits as we've gone along. And today we're looking at uh, paying attention to hopeful people listen and learn and the examples that we can find in Scripture on that. So I chose a series on hope because of the impact that hope has on our daily lives and uh, the pull of the world to have us focus on the hopeless aspects of life that we see every day in the world and even in ourselves to say, maybe I haven't changed that much, the, you know, the, the negative things. In the beginning I asked, how would you define or describe hope? And so we came up with some synonyms, similar words. To have hope is to have anticipation, assurance, a wish, the thing that we're looking for. And what I found interesting was our, the negative description, to be without hope. How do you describe that? What's that type of mindset? Despair, fear, uncertainty. And the world lives without hope. There's a lot of it that just focuses on the negative that is in a different realm or experience and doesn't know what to put their hope in. We can add our hope to Jesus. Because hope is more than wishful thinking. It's not just having a better mindset at life, although those will help you for sure. A positive mindset's probably going to help you more than a negative mindset. But hope is more than wishful thinking. In uh, the material that, that I've used in the past, we're tied to agency thinking. That is, what or where do we want to go to from here? So this is where we're at, but where do we want to go to or what different state of mind, of practice, behavior, even environment do we want to get to from here? That's one thing is to identify, here's where we're at, but what might be next? agency thinking and pathway thinking is what are the motivations and actions that can help us to go from where we are to where we want to be. So if that's where I want to be or I think I can get there, what are the options? How, what are steps and stages? What are the basics? What's it going to take to help move in that direction? The agency and the pathway thinking. So by adding an action component, we move from wishful thinking to participants in whom hope grows so that we can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit into the lives of others because hope is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Hope is a gift for the Holy Spirit for those that are baptized into Christ. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit available from within for those who have died to their old life and accepted Jesus as Lord in baptism. And if you've not made the exchange, we urge you to come to Jesus for salvation. We urge you to come to Jesus for a new life. His blessing of hope then fills us from the inside out for our benefit and the benefit of those around us. Because of the change available by the washing away of the old and the new life after baptism, we have access to the true and eternal hope of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Because God is the God of hope, we reflect his character through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we reflect the spirit that is within us much like the moon reflects the light of the sun, even in darkness. We reflect a hope that's been shining in us and through us. And it's a hope for eternal salvation that we want for everyone. Through the series, we've looked at growing in hope as people who have been connected to the traits of hopeful. We've talked about these traits as a a way of looking at the series, to be humble and honest, observant and obedient, to be people of praise and perseverance, expectant and engaged, faithful and focused. Last week, unswerving and united, and this week, finishing the series, because there are no more letters, listening and learning. I had to double check that hopeful wasn't two L's. But we have then added a memory verse. Has that been helpful? Uh, a verse, something that you can go to that just reminds us of the core concept. And that verse was, may the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the of the Holy Spirit isn't that a it's such a good passage it's such an encouraging passage a blessing to somebody here's what I want in your life here's what God can do do you need joy and peace I know where we find it What's the one thing we do to receive this? Trust. Just learn to trust. Little by little, the more we can let go of that and trust, the more we're filled with these things. And it's such a blessing passage. And here's another little hint on this. You can pray this for people. It's nice if they know, but this is what we want for people. We want them to overflow with hope because of the power of the Holy Spirit. That their lives, instead of despair and anguish and desperation, become, wow, God is good. And so, part of the reason we try to live hopeful lives is as an influence on others. Well, we noted last week that Solomon was a... Solomon was a swerver. Samson was a swerver, too. <laughs> so there are lots of examples of those that you think there's so much potential. And there's two different types of swerving. A, a toddler is swerving because they're immature. They don't, they don't have balance. A distracted driver is immature in a different way. They're not thinking of the impact that their swerving has on those around them. Swerving can be part of developmental maturity or it just can be immaturity and selfishness. If we're focused on the wrong parts, we can swerve. Repentance is the swerving back, to come back to God and realign ourselves with him and who he is. Instead of swerving, we can be steadfast, we can stand firm, we can be solid, we can be mature, we can be trustworthy. Those are the passages, the ideas that come up in a number of passages calling us to do that. Which means we take course corrections. Not every decision is great, but we know how to get back on course. We know who calls us back. We know the anchor of our soul. Hopeful Christians are as unswerving as they can be. Right? Sometimes the wind knocks you over. Sometimes you do sway. But you try to be unswerving. They course correct when they waver. They need others who are united in the faith and the call to faithfulness. We need one another. And so thank you for your example and your encouragement to help one another in honesty. Not perfection, but in honesty. That the struggle is there, but we can encourage one another because God can bring us back on course. Jesus models all of these traits, right? I thought we haven't just focused on Jesus. Jesus models the traits of listening and learning that we are examining today. He modeled them and his apostles learned to listen and they learned to learn from Jesus, which then connected them to God the Father as well. Jesus didn't have an easy life. Jesus just didn't have guaranteed obedience. I think that's something that we have to come to realize. He didn't just phone it in. He didn't just check mark everything. He did struggle with listening and learning. He had to learn. Isn't that amazing? God, in the flesh, had to learn. He also had to listen. He needed to learn how to listen, and he learned how to be obedient to his father, and God's will, which is a truth that's well developed in the Gospel of John. In John, we read of this connection that Jesus has with the Father, where he listened, he learned, and he obeyed. And the passages come up. John 4, 34, My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Well, how did he know the will of him who sent me? He had to listen, and he had to learn. John 5.30, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. 
I judge only as I hear. John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Knowing his purpose, knowing his mission, knowing what he was to do because of his connection to the Father. 8.26, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him, I like this one, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Now we're not reading the before and after because many of these and then there's a fight with the Pharisees, right? There's either a fight with the Pharisees before the passage, or there's a fight with the Pharisees after the passage, or because of the statement. But he just says, this is, I am doing because of my connection. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Listened and learned from the Father. In ch chapter 12, 49 and 50, I did not speak of my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. That's pretty confident. Whatever I say is just what the Father told me to say. That's somebody being led, listening, learning, and following. I'm not saying much more to you, for the Prince of the world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And then we have come now, let us leave. So we know where we're at. Because things are about to get extra difficult. And in 1510, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. That's what he tells the it's what he tells his followers. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain as his love. The example of him listening, learning, and showing obedience to the point that he could say to the apostles just before the crucifixion, you've learned this. You've watched me do this. I didn't give you a standard that I didn't keep. Pay attention because you're going to need this. When Jesus saw a crippled man lying near the pool of Bethsaida in John 5, he answered, I only did what my father told me to do. That's pretty cool. I only did what my father told me to do. He explained, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. Jesus stated very plainly, my father taught me everything I'm supposed to do. Jesus in his flesh had to rely on a daily inner working of the father's voice to direct him. He had to hear his father's voice hour by hour, miracle by miracle, one day at a time. He took time to be with his father and listen to learn, as we see in verses like five, Luke 5, 15 and 16. Yet news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In order for him to go and speak what the Father had said, he needed to have time with the Father. And so his habit was to have that filling and then expression. Filling and expression. And we read of him listening, learning, and obedience. Jesus learned things. Somehow that still amazes me. Because he's God. Like, what does God have to learn? Well, when you take on flesh, you've got to learn. He had to choose to be faithful. It wasn't just going to be easy. He had to make a choice. So there's a few passages that I want to take a look here in Hebrews that we're going to get to. As a child, he obeyed his parents, right? As an adult, he obeyed the law. Fulfilled all righteousness. All his life, Jesus completely fulfilled the Father's will. He knew that obedience was prior to his incarnation, of course, but he learned obedience on earth by experiencing it. In every situation, no matter how difficult, the Son was obedient to the Father. He learned to obey. 
Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. In that he himself was suffered being tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. But in Hebrews 2, 17, for this reason, because he's here to help humans instead of angels, he had to be make, made like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, in order to be that one who appeases the wrath of God. He had to be just like us. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being, in the process of being tempted, because he learned what it was like to be tempted. God cannot be tempted. But Jesus had to learn what that was like. And because of that, he can help the rest of us. As we're being tempted, like, oh, I know what that's like. That's not as easy as what it seems. But there's a way through it. Later on in Hebrews chapter 5, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears as the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. A different standard, a different way. Jesus learned obedience through suffering. And that made him able to be our sacrificial offering. And so when Jesus speaks, his followers listen. The example in John chapter 10, 14 through 16, Jesus modeled obedience and faithfulness to the apostles, and they were called to learn and to listen from him. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. When hope is diminishing, listen to God. Listen and learn. Listen and learn, and our hope will increase because he cares. He is our shepherd. He's watching over us. He's helping us. Couldn't leave this passage out. Matthew 17, 5, we have the impactful passage for Peter, James, and John. They have a unique experience with Jesus that involves hearing the voice of God say, well, he, not Jesus, <laughs> Peter was still speaking. A bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased, which is the same that was said at the baptism. But in the transfiguration we have, listen to him. If we're going to grow in hope, it means listening to Jesus. Because he listened to the Father and he can help us listen to him. And that was their call. That was what they were left with. Listening to Jesus is a base aspect of following Jesus. It was true for the apostles, including Paul. And it's true for us today. Listening and learning are key traits for those who put their hope in Jesus and who overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do we listen and learn? What are some of the ways that we do that? Well, one of the aspects of this we often call spiritual disciplines. The ways that we pay attention to God and we learn from God. Uh, Trevor in Adult Bible Class led us through Richard Foster's book, The Adult Bible Study, and we talked about some of the disciplines. There's inward disciplines within ourselves, meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. So how, does, how do those help you listen? How do those help you learn? See? There's the outward disciplines, like simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. So the things that we do, how we share that with others, and they help us then in obedience. But then there's the corporate disciplines that's not just me, it's the us part. The confession, the worship guidance, and celebration. The coming together to 
as a group. They also help us listen, learn, and obey. And they help us grow in hope. Which ones do you practice and how do they help you? How does meditation, prayer, fasting, and study help you with the others? Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. But he also memorized a lot of scripture. <laughs> he also knew a lot of passages. He also understood God. He also worshipped. He also had a life of solitude, submission, service, and simplicity. We learn from Jesus. And these aspects can be helpful for us. I have a handout at the front that lists those, but it also lists another way of looking at spiritual discipline. Some others that you may consider be helpful to you. So that's available today if you want to do that. We can follow the example of Jesus. His apostles were called to and they did. And it led to them being hope-filled and hopeful people. Jesus modeled these for his followers and people have modeled them for you. And who is learning how to listen to Jesus and learn from him from your example and your practices. People need a connection to God, but we may connect to God in different situations and in different circumstances or ways. That's the focus of the next sermon series. How do we connect to God? The different ways and aspects that we connect to God. So here we are wrapping it up. What impacts you from the sermon in the series? Part of it that impacted me was the number of passages in John and that Jesus really learned because he listened. Where do you think you'll connect with the application or the need of the topic of hope? Where does hope, that topic, that concept most apply to you right now? Whose life can God's hope overflow through you? You're being blessed to be hopeful so that it's not just your hope, but you can share hope. Have you grown in being hope-filled and hopeful? Where and how might you have room for further development? Which of these traits are you stronger at? Which ones are weaker? Where would you need the reminder in the future? So this week, enjoy the hope that's in Jesus and share the invite for others to come to Jesus for salvation because that's where true hope is. Without that, we have an influence of the Spirit. With salvation, we have an outpouring of the Spirit. And it overflows through us. Let's conclude with a call of blessing, which hopefully may be familiar to you. Do you know what it is? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the church says, Amen. Amen.